everybody. Thank you all so much for coming to this Disability Awareness Month event. My name is Jenny Sandler. I'm the Director of Access Services and Achieve here at Highline. And want to welcome you all here today. Before I formally introduce our speaker today, I would like to show a video that she did in this past summer. Um, as many of you may know, it's the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And uh, we're, so we have an event later in the month to celebrate that and give a little bit more about the history of that important legislation. Um, but Ivanova spoke um, in downtown Seattle at an ADA rally. And I thought it was powerful, powerful message. We kind of wanted to start with that today. And then I will introduce her. Often, in the name of inclusion or mainstreaming. 
Today, Ivanova is a college graduate with a bachelor's degree in history from Central Washington University, a University of Washington LEND Fellow, and LEND is Leadership Education in Neurodevelopmental and Related Disabilities, a civil rights advocate, and a part-time faculty here in our chief program at Highline. Very honored to have her here with us. As we see increasing numbers of students with disabilities accessing higher education, Ivanova is going to be sharing with us a timely and powerful message about true inclusion. Hello everybody, my name is Ivanova Smith and I'm really excited here to talk to you about inclusion. I'm really passionate about trying to make sure that every person with a di disability, no, no matter the severity, has a place in this world and that we are all part of this community together and we will all be included and have access. So I'm really excited to say to you some ways that we can make that happen. Um, because of the space we have here, I was wanting to do this rock, paper, scissors game where we um, Find a partner, and you play rock, paper, scissors. If anybody doesn't know what rock, paper, scissors is, it's a game where you um, rock, uh, uh, paper beats rock, rock beats scissors, and scissors be, um, beats paper. Does that make sense? And so what I want you to, if it's, um, would it, I'm not sure what the safety standards for this would be. Um, if really carefully you yeah, move, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, Do you want to just kind of talk about the game and, and, and yeah. how it represents inclusion? Okay, so I, I was going to have us act out this game and play it so that you would have a physical experience with it, but um, basically I wanted to show is a version of this game that has everyone being able to, to, to participate even if they lose. So what you would have done if you had played this game is you would have gone with a partner, you would have done rock, paper, scissors, and the person who lost, they would start cheering for the person who won and they, 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 a, a line would form around the person and everybody would be cheering until you got two crowds of people cheering for the other side cheering for this side and then there would be a big one, two people battling it out and everybody cheering behind them and that is how the game would end with everybody cheering and everybody participating and being happy and being able to be involved. And the point of that game I wanted to show that no matter your skill level, no matter um, what abilities you have or limitations you have, there's always a way that you could participate in any activity. And so even, you know, for the person who lost, they still got to participate to the end, just like the person who won. It was just in a different way. And so if we learn about all the different ways a person could participate in an activity, it would help us uh, increase our understanding of inclusion and allow more inclusion. So another thing I wanted to talk about is the difference between mainstreaming and inclusion. Now, I'm, I'd just like to know a little bit about my audience here. How, uh, how many are here are students? Okay. How many are here are faculty? All right. How many here are community members that uh, come from the public? Anybody? Okay. Awesome. Um, so, one thing with um, some people may, have, some of you may have been aware of mainstreaming, where you may have, in, when you were in high school, or you know, in, school, in um, grade school, you, know, you may have saw one or two disabled students in your classes. Now, the issue with mainstreaming that I've experienced in my own personal life is that it wasn't really a positive experience. Mainstreaming first came out and you know when IDEA came out, the um, a act that will help uh, be able to make the schools more accessible for students with disabilities and help form the special ed program and IEPs. Um, 
they started doing the mainstreaming. And I was one of those IEP kids. When I came to this country in 1994, um, I was mainstreamed. And you know, I've, I had some times where I was in the special ed classes, and those were honestly the best times for me. Now, a lot of students, they didn't like being um, secluded in the self-contained classroom. But for me, because of the amount of bullying I had to go through, and the f lack of support that I got, I actually didn't like mainstreaming. I felt very isolated, and I didn't have access to my community. I didn't even know about my community, because for a long time, I didn't know about my, what, what type of disability I had. Why was I struggling with learning? Why was I in special ed? These questions I didn't know. And it made me struggle with my own identity, trying to figure that out. I wasn't able to be with my own community. There were people in my life that were telling me, well, we don't want you to associate with those students. And they were talking about the students in the self-contained classroom, which most the majority of intellectual and developmentally disabled students all put in. Um, and I also saw disparities because even though you know, I had a negative experience, I did have more academic access. I was able to take history classes and math classes and English classes. But my ID peers that were in a self-contained classroom, they weren't, they weren't allowed to have access to these academic courses. In a way, it is a lot like this model you know, you have a couple of students are allowed to be uh, included, you know, allowed to have academic courses, where you have some, a lot of students, they don't get any participation at all. They're blocked, as you can see. And, you know, the typical student, they, they get to see everything. And that's great and all, but the problem is, what about the student right here? Their education is lacking. They don't have the same equity of they don't have the same equality of education as this student may have. And even though, you know, there were times that I felt like this student, but in the classroom I felt like this student because I felt like even though I was there in the class, I wasn't wanted. I, don't, I wasn't valued. There would be times that students would be like, "Why are you in this class?" Or nobody wants you here. That was, my, that was my history. That was what happened to me. And I mean, dealing with you know, being on the mainstream bus, it honestly made me not want to be with typically developing students because they didn't want me. They didn't like me. And I didn't understand why. And so looking at that past, I see now that there was a real equity issue. I wasn't getting the support. I wasn't getting the protections because even though my ID peers, they were not in academic classes, they had more protections. They were able, they had their identity, they had their community. I didn't have, they had a protection from the bullies. They had protections in other ways that I really wanted. Friendships that I could have built with people I related with. And I couldn't get access to that. And so that is why I want to fight for this model of inclusion. That people, everyone is included, every student. There's no self-contained classroom. I want an inclusion that the people that need support, they get the support they need. And this may mean reformatting assignments because not everyone can write with their hands or you know, type with their fingers. Sometimes people learn the best by speaking it out or drawing a visual understanding of it. People with intellectual and developmental disabilities, it's not that we don't learn, it's that we learn differently. We learn in a different way. We may learn slower. It may take us more time. We may have to repeat ourselves to learn things. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have access to all the academic courses out there so that we can have the highest quality education and be able to have access to higher education. I would love to, f to find more e institutions, e e educational institutions, that would go, f that would think about what are the different ways that people can express their knowledge. Is it only writing and reading? 
or other, other ways that people can express it. I think we are, and if we start looking and we start being creative about how we do assignments and how we become, we allow people to express their knowledge in multiple different ways, that our ed education system can become accessible to intellectually and developmentally disabled people. It may take more time. It may take um, f changing the assignments a little bit so that it, it, it's more formatted to what the student can understand and learn to their style. Sometimes people struggle with this because a lot of times people think, oh, well, you know, putting the boxes like this, it takes away a box from this kid. It's not that this kid's box got taken away. This, this kid didn't need a box. He's fully able to see and everything. He just doesn't need it. He just, he doesn't need it. Well, these other two, they needed to be able to see and participate. And so what we want in inclusion is for everyone to be able to participate. And we need, maybe they need more support to do that. Maybe we need to rethink how we allow people to express their knowledge. That is what I want to try to show with tr um, inclusion with this model. To show, because just because a person may learn differently doesn't mean they shouldn't have access to all of the academic courses. I mean, there were people in the past that told me you can never be a history major. You can't, you know, learn history. But I proved those people wrong. And I said to them, I love history. I absolutely love academics. But because my community has been so excluded from academics, it's hard for me because I want, I want to prove that my community can be just as academic as any other community. <clears throat> so there are some barriers to inclusion that our history has shown us. And I'm going to talk about these barriers. The first one is the mental age theory. And this is just a visual representation of it. This was an old diagram from the eugenics era. And it shows the different ways that people categorize people with intellectual disabilities back in those days. You may be familiar with these words. Has anybody been familiar with these words? Mm, imbecile, idiot, moron. You've all heard those words before. Those were all diagnostic categories for intellectual disability, which at the time was called feeble-mindedness, which later was um, and which later replaced by the R word mental retardation. Um, this theory basically says that people with intellectual disabilities are mentally children, that we are stuck as children even when we're adults. And there are a lot of people that they still treat people with intellectual disabilities this way. I've actually been treated like this myself. You know, being a married college graduate that's a part-time faculty at this wonderful institution, it's really awkward when people call me kiddo. <laughs> and, <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, oh, you're so sweet to that young boy. You're so sweet to that, that that young person, you know, th but they're very kind of, they, or they may speak in a more um, singy, songy voice to me. It's like, oh, you're just so cute. <laughs> 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 and it's like, yes, you know, I'm holding this little Chewbacca here, my little comfort buddy, and I understand that some people may look at that and say, oh, well, look at you, you're holding a little toy. Of course you're mentally a child. You know, and people may see that on the street because they don't know me. But the thing is, I want you all to think about, we all have childhood passions that we still enjoy. And I know many people that still, that have no disabilities whatsoever, that have a childlike personality. They just like childlike things. My sister, for example, she has no disabilities, no developmental disabilities, but boy, is she obsessed with Care Bears. <laughs> like, she's upset. I mean, she has the trash can and the posters, and she has all the Disney posters and all of the figurines, and she wears the sweatsuits. I mean, she's a big Care Bear fan, but I still respect her as my adult sister. She's older than me, and she, she can drive, and she does all these other things, and she's, you know, a, an adult. And I've other adults, you know, they, 
still respect it even with a child like Parsons. And I think the same needs to be said for people with intellectual disabilities. Yeah, I have a childlike personality. That doesn't mean that I'm not an adult. I'm 27 years old. I'm an adult, and that's true for all people with intellectual disabilities, that when we become adults, we become adults. We, we have the same passions as other adults. We have the same interests. I mean, there's so many things we can learn if we realize that and see that ID people are not children. We are, we, when we become adults, we're adults, and we need to be prepared for that. Our youth need to be prepared for that for that. And so I, that's one barrier that's really blocked people. And this has actually prevented people with intellectual disabilities from getting married. This has prevented pe blocked people from getting into relationship because they are having children. Like, for example, um, you know, they would take the child, CPS, they would take the child away from an IDD mother and they would say, well, it's because they're mentally a child. They can't, they're a child themselves, so they can't take of a child. And that is why I want to debunk this theory, because I believe people with intellectual and developmental disabilities have the right to have children and have families and be able to get married and, and, and be able to explore and celebrate all of these adult things that we get the privilege to have when we become the age of majority. It's also difficult when I'm wanting to go get order a drink and I have to <laughs> convince people and then it's like, wait, but I always sold my ID so they had to set up then. <laughs> yeah, so the next one I wanted to talk about is, uh, is this little boy and he represents pity. So for a lot of people with disabilities, they've had to deal with this. If people looking at them and saying, oh, your life must have been so awful. Your life must be so terrible. I feel so bad for you. And they don't really see the person's accomplishments or see what they are doing and see how do they feel about them lives. Like, because, you know, when people look at me and they say, oh, you know, what's it like struggling with autism? And I'm like, I like being autistic. <laughs> I have no problem being this way. It's like, I don't like how, I don't like how society treats me, but, I like being this way and I like it when people love me and s see how epic it is, but I mostly have a problem when people have a bad attitude about it. <laughs> I love, I, I like my life, I'm happy, you don't need to pity me. You know, let, you know I, I live my life just like any other human being and that's the same for any other person with a disability. They live their life just like any other human being. Yeah, there will be difficult times, but that's true for everyone. And so, you know, we start thinking that we're all people, we're all humans, and we all have times of suffering, but we also all have times of joy, and we all have passions and values, and we want those to be seen, and we want to see, we want all of our identities to be seen, not just our disability identity, but other identities we may have, our cultural identities, our sexual orientation identities, our gender identities, all of these different identities come into play with every different, all people with disabilities. We all have different identities and we don't want all of our other identities being masked behind disability all the time. Um, now I'm going to talk about the Superman. Now the Superman theory is kind of like the extreme opposite end of, oh you're so inspirational just because you got up in the morning. <laughs> it's like, oh my god. It, and also, this one has been used for something called, which um, a famous activist, Stella Young, who recently passed away, she brought up this phrase called inspiration porn. And it's basically the idea that there are images that are used, that non-disabled people use of people with disabilities to build inspiration. Have you ever seen the images of like a little kid running with, you know, paralytics and the, it's like your ad, um, the only disability is a bad attitude. Anybody seen those? S yeah, that basically is an example of inspiration porn because it, 
it, it basically puts, it, 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 bas first it guilt trip people into, you know, if you're having a bad day, get over it. Because look at these poor disabled people, they had to live with it, kind of thing. And, you know, so it kind of mixes with pity and um, together because, it, and also it's not good for disabled people because, you know, when we have that bad day, you know, and, you know, the, my attitude isn't, if I'm a person that's in a wheelchair, my attitude's not going to change the fact that I can't get up these stairs. And that was actually the point that Stella Young made. That, you know, it doesn't help people with disabilities. It doesn't, it honestly puts them in an awkward position when, you know, they can't do everything that the poster makes them out to be. You know, we're all human and we're all going to have bad days and we shouldn't be shamed for that or say, um, our disability, being a disabled is just having a bad attitude. Being disabled is an identity, and is an identity that needs to be respected. And it's not an attitude problem for somebody to say, "Hey, I'm disabled, and I have a limitation with this." That's not a bad attitude. That's a person that needs accommodation and accessibility. So the next one is the spread effect, and basically what that one says is. It basically is the idea that the disability, it, it's like what I was saying earlier with a lot of other identities in a person gets erased when they're identified as disabled. And sometimes there's people with disabilities that they don't want to identify with their disability because, well, I don't want to overshadow my other identities because these other identities I may have are more important. And also it could, it, it's frustrating when you may have like you may have one ability that may be different from what is characterized with your disability and people get all shocked and they're like how are you able to do that you had this disability and it's like well I don't have that aspect or that my disability doesn't affect me in that way for example a lot of people with disabilities have had to deal with people asking them about oh can you have sex what? yeah like there are people with disabilities that they've had to deal with that, where people think because you have a disability, you can't do that. And that, that's an example of the spread effect. So that, that's an also an issue for people with disabilities that have to deal with, is people thinking their disability affects them in a way that it doesn't. <sighs> and all of these, you know, all of these connect together because I mean, thinking somebody is mentally a child also makes you think, oh, they can't, you know, they, this aspect, their disability makes them can't do all these other things, when really they can. <laughs> so they all interconnect. Um, so I'm going to talk about language here. And so there's two different models of language that people use. People first language, which is very popular in the intellectually disabled community and identity for this language, which is very popular in the autistic community, actually. But I actually respect both. And I see, you know, I, I believe that every person with a disability, they have a different aspect. They have a different view and perspective on their disability. They don't, they may not want to identify it. They might want to say, I'm a, I'm a person first. You know, my disability is secondary. And so, you know, it's more respectful to use people first language with people that that's how they feel about their disability. And that should be respected. Just like it should be respected if a, a person says, well, I do identify with my disability and I take pr great pride in it. Then that should be just as cool too because what's wrong with being, having pride in your disability? That's awesome. I have great pride in my disability and I, I actually use, I, I use a mix of the two now, but I used to just use, call myself autistic all the time. But um, I've learned since I um, met other people that were more in this category of liking people first, that you know, people first language had this value that um, basically what people first language came out during the disability civil rights movement. And it basically was saying, um, we want to be seen as equal people, people like you. We don't want to be seen by our disabilities because at the time, you know, that label of disability, like mental retardation, 
Um, it put people in institutions. It imprisoned people. It took away people's rights. It took away people's freedoms. And so that label became very negative. But people first wanted to get the idea that we're people, we're humans. We should have the same equal rights. We should have the same respect. We should be free like everyone else. And so that is the main point of people first language. And I think that that's historically very valuable. And identity first language really, you know, it, it, it used to be used in a label type way of, that was very negative back in the 1950s you know, or so because the word mental retardation actually was the politically correct word back then. Like it was the word that replaced feeble mindedness. And so that's the one thing I want to think, guys think about with language is, you know, when people say, oh, we just need to ban these words and replace them. Well, we already done that with feeble mindedness. So I think that really we should concentrate more on the attitude behind the language. You know, when you call somebody retarded, what, are, what is your attitude behind that? Or when you think, when you think of people with intellectual disabilities in a negative light, or you think of that disability in a negative light, you're basically sowing a, 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 a negative attitude towards that. And so I, you know, I don't care if people want to use it in the scientific sense of, oh, you know, I'm driving down the road and the car behind me, the car ahead of me is retarding to the speed of 50 when it really is 60, the speed limit is 60 or something, you know, they're being, you know, if you're using the scientific way that, because the word retarded means slow. It doesn't, but it's different when you use it in the context of, oh, my homework is so retarded. And I've heard this phrase over and over again. And I honestly respond to these people who say that. I'm like, how is your homework like me? <laughs> 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 it's because this person, they put a negative stance on the word, that's what I have the issue with. Because it says that that is bad. That being slow is bad. That being slow is negative and annoying and good. But I want to change that so that people understand that being slow isn't a bad thing. Having trouble learning or being slow at learning, having a different way of learning shouldn't be seen as a bad thing. And so I don't really want to focus on banning language. I want to focus on banning the mean bad attitudes about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Does that make sense to everybody? Cool. So now I want to go into the history of um, the eugenics movement. So the eugenics movement was, um, it was started with uh, uh, um, Darwin and he, it, he created the, you know, the survival of the fittest and s social Darwinism, but his cousin looked at his work, his cousin, Francis Glanton, looked at his work and said, ooh, I really like this. And took some of it and used it to create eugenic science, which basically was to him the science of making a superior human. And now we know today his idea of a superior human was very racist and misogynist. So, um, he believed that only white men, and you know, if they breded with a white, healthy woman, that that was the only type of human that were good to breed. And they wanted to try to get all of the negative, uh, pe all the, they saw people that were inferior, people that were not the male white, whoever Francis Glanton felt, but if the person was Slavic, if they had a disability, if they were, you know, not that, um, what Francis Glutton said, they, he would try to say, we need to pull their genes out of the gene pool. And so he uh, promoted a bunch of policies that would sterilize people with disabilities so that they could not have children, and the rise of institutionalization of people with intellectual or developmental disabilities. And this science became very famous. It became really popular in the US. And then 
a, a, young, a young Austrian fellow of, named Adolf Hitler got interested in it as well in the 1920s and said, I'm going to take this back to the Deutschland. And that's how you get the German euthanasia program that uh, got the ga uh, uh, gas chambers started is because of the American eugenics movement it was so popular in the 1920s that the Nazis used it for their youth in Asia program, which was a program that the Nazis would take people with disabilities that were in institutions, they would make them go into a shower, and they, they killed them with gas. And it's, it's really sad. They called it mercy killing. And it was all based off of this idea of eugenics, of these people need to be weeded out of the gene pool. We got to get rid of these people so that only the pure blood people can produce, and we would only have pure blood people in the human population gene pool and not the defectives. I'm, and I'm using quotations because I don't believe in any of this. This is just the history. And so since, um, so because of that, there were a lot of institutionalization. Even people that were my level of functioning were put in these institutions. There, were, um, there was a court case about a woman that um, she got uh, the Supreme Court ordered her to be sterilized because uh, she had a child she was born of a person with a disability, and she ended up having a disability. And they were in the institution together, and then she had a kid, and they didn't, and the institution people didn't like that, and so they made this fancy court case to try to get um, professional sterilization done to a lot of people with intellectual or developmental disabilities. And it basically made it so they couldn't have children. And so that's the all people here today, the people today, that they didn't know that they were sterilized, but they found out later in life. And they're, they're very upset that, you know, their right to produce, reproduce was taken away. And it was a lot to have to do because of the eugenic movement. Um, we were isolated and segregated. You know, we, we were saying we need to be hidden. We were criminalized, too, because, you know, if you, a lot of the old documents that talk about this, they would refer to the people with disabilities that were in institutions as inmates, as prisoners. You know, they, they didn't see them as people that, you know, just needed support and help. They saw us as a nuisance. And there would be full articles talking about how intellectually disabled people, well, at the time they used the word feeble-mindedness, were nuisances, they were criminals, they were just going to bring more crime to your town. You don't want them. If we put them in these institutions and we make sure they don't reproduce, then it will be all good. And you don't have to worry about it. And we would just keep these horny criminals away. And so that's why a lot of us, we were institutionalized for a long time. But in the future, there were organizations that actually helped to end that. And the civil disability civil rights movement led to, and a lot of other civil rights movements in the 1960s led to um, starting to de-institutionalize uh, people with disabilities. It thought putting things in the community so that people with disabilities could start getting support in the community and not in institutions. And the eugenics movement lost favor in the 1940s after World War II, after the Holocaust was discovered and all the evidence was discovered of what Hitler was doing, and they realized, we probably shouldn't be doing that over here anymore, because then if the Nazis are doing it, we better stop be doing it. <laughs> so we started to stop sterilizing people in the 1950s to 60s. There were still, still states that you know, they didn't stop until the 80s, which is ridiculous, but it did happen. And this is a frustration. And um, it really, um, it, it caused an inclusion barrier because, you know, you had these people that were in the institutions for most of their lives, and they were taught that they were mentally children, that when they came out, it was really hard to adjust. 
And so there were things that they, you know, we had, they had to learn. And there was troubles at first because, you know, there were people that, you know, they would get lost or, you know, there wasn't enough support. And that's even today. We asked in Washington, and I'm sorry to say this, but our state kind of sucks for this. We have four institutions still running. Institutions like that still running in Washington that put people with intellectual disabilities away. And one of them actually got in serious trouble, we hoped would get in serious trouble because they violated, they had 40,000 violations, under, uh, CMS violations, and they still didn't get shut down, even though People First and all these other self-advocacy organizations, we were working with DRW and all of these places to try, but come on, come on, they have 40,000 violations. Why can't we shut this place down? And uh, the argument was, oh, but there's still people that need to be segregated because there's not enough funding in the community. Well, how about if you shut down institutions and you take all that funding that's like millions of dollars that's in the institution and put it in the community? Why don't you do that? That's what we should be doing. But we haven't been doing it. Thank you. <laughs> And that's something that I am fighting for. I am fighting to get those institutions closed down. And so are other self-advocacy groups that I'm part of. We've been working hard, but it's still a struggle in our state. And the thing is, though, other states have been able to shut them down. So Washington, I don't see any excuses for this. <laughs> Alaska, actually, was gloating at us for, haha, well, we got them shut down. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> So these are just some of the organizations that I've even met with or worked with that have been really helpful to, for the disability community. And um, the first one, you know, the People First of Washington, they were a great organization that uh, were really in the forefront of the disability rights movement. And they're really all about helping intellectually developmentally disabled adults advocate for ourselves and build community and work in the community. And so it's a really great organization. And they're really about people first, and our disabilities are secondary. And they're all about closing down those darn institutions. They've been wanting to get them closed down. Um, the ARC, which actually is a, used to be a parent group that was started in the 1930s. Uh, their name used to be the Association of Retarded Children, but then it was renamed to the Association of Retarded Citizens. And I want to say that because the thing is, even though they had that name, they had the right attitude. They didn't want people in the institution. They were the parents that were like, well, we want to be able to take care of our kid and get funding to be able to do that and support. And so they really advocated for that. And they really... And then when the 1960s came out and we started seeing a growth of self-advocates, they really took that on and was like, yeah, self-advocates. We need more people like that. That's, you know, nothing about us without us. And so the ARC really tried to take on that message of, you know, supporting people with intellectual disabilities. And, you know, they had the right attitude, even though they had, you know, that name. You know, that's from the past. And even with that, they, you know, changed it. It's not an acronym anymore. Now it's just the ARC. It's no acronym. I like to create an acronym for the, the Association of Remarkable People. <laughs> Remarkable <laughs> Citizens. That's what I like to call it. Um, another organization that and I absolutely love the ARC, and I actually was an intern for the ARC of King County, and they really taught me a lot about the state advocacy here in Washington, really helped me get into community advocacy, so I'm really grateful to them. Um, Special Olympics, they, were a, they uh, provided a lot of recreational and sports opportunities for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and uh, they've also been really promoting this inclusive model of, hey, you know, you, you, know, you want to play sports with everybody else, we're, we're going to try to help you do that with Unified Sports, which is a program that has people with disabilities and without disabilities playing together, and they're really trying to promote that in the schools. And the history of the organization, it was founded by Eunice Kennedy Shriver, 
and she was related to the Kennedys. And um, they had a, uh, her brother had a, a sister that had an intellectual disability. And I think that's really what sparked her passion for creating it because originally it was a camp and it was a sports camp because he saw that, you know, we didn't really have any sports opportunities. And so she provided that for uh, uh, intellectually disabled people. And boy, do I love it. Like, I absolutely love Special Olympics. And in the past, yes, it was, it was you know, more segregated. But I mean, that kind of with the times. And as times move and as things progress, they realize, they, you know, they change the model and they realize, you know, you know, we should be including our athletes in our leadership and having their input be first. And so they really thought taking that on when, and um, created Unify, Project Unify, which was about trying to bring inclusion in the schools to be able to play on the same teams as everyone else. And, um, that's just something they're really big on, and also they're really big on athlete leadership. I'm actually an athlete ambassador for Special Olympics, uh, for Special Olympics Washington, and I do leadership I do leadership events with them. Um, I'm part of the athlete input council and the women's com uh, women's sports committee, and I absolutely love my time there. And they really want to take in all input, and so that is one reason why I put them on the list. It's they really started listening to ID people and said, you know, you guys are the forefront of this and not um, able by people. So I think that's really great. And now they're actually helping athletes become coaches and in other positions like officials and referees even. So it's really cool. So anyone who's in Special Olympics and they're interested in that, yeah, check it out. It's really cool. And um, Self-advocates being empowered. This is a national self-advocacy group. I put them out because I met them in Washington, D.C., and they have regions all around the country, and they do national legislative advocacy and work on the national issues around disability policy. Um, Self-advocates and leadership, that's actually the, uh, a group I'm part of, and they meet he at CTEC every second Tuesday of the month. Um, and they are a really great group. They are, they are made up of self-advocates. And we work on legislative advocacy here in the Washington state. And we concentrate on the legislation and policy advocacy here. And so, you know, we're cre actually working on some bills right now talking about how do we make, um, uh, how do we, uh, shut down the institutions and they work with legislators on that, you know, uh, gave rid of the sub-minimum wage. Um, a bunch of, uh, there's a bill that tried to pass that would make it, they, that would replace the, um, the accessible parking placards with just the, the still person in a wheelchair to a more active person in a wheelchair to kind of show that, you know, we're, we're, we're active in our lives. You know, we're not just sitting there, we're active. Um, so that's, what, that's just some of the things that they're working on. Um, the UACD in the LEND is a, I'm part of the, um, the LEND the University of Washington led and I'm actually the, I was actually the first advocate fellow last year and it's a, basically a training program for medical professionals to work on policy and leadership positions and helping families that are affected by uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. And so they work on a lot of policy, and we look at the medical aspects of the developmental disabilities, and you know we help screen, and they help screen children and help families with the diagnostic process. And so this last year, they were really excited to have an advocate fellow, a person with a developmental disability, to you know represent our side and they really liked what they what I did and so they've asked me all to stay uh, stay again as the senior advocate fellow and the and the, uh, the land is under the AUCD which is the Association of University Centers of Disability and it was cr it was a program that was created by uh, the Kennedys which uh, helps create funding for um, 
screenings for developmental disabilities, funding for diagnostic research and research on disability, and uh, policy. So it's a really great organization and um, they do a lot of national work as well. I got to go to the disability policy seminar last year and got to talk to the uh, our state legislators in Washington, D.C., federal legislators in Washington, D.C. with the lead, and it was really cool and great. And that's my passion is, you know, giving them the message that, you know, we want equal rights and we want pride, you know, we don't want this negativity that sometimes the medical community likes to throw out. Like, you know, the doctors, you know, kind of, oh, we got to give the parents the bad news. It's like, don't give them bad news, give them like, your child's a blessing, they're just uniquely different, you know, it's different news, it's not bad news. And that's kind of one thing I'm trying to express to them because sometimes, you know, they um, have problems, you know, I'm about, you know, disability pride, it's cool being disabled, so that is, those are the organizations I wanted to show you. Um, these are just some laws that have helped bring inclusion to people with disabilities. Um, the ADA. The Olmstead decision helped with the accessible housing and helping people with disabilities be, have more access to their communities. Um, IDEA was used to help uh, the, have um, access to education because before there were people with disabilities that would be put in separate schools or specialized schools instead of being able to just go to the school in their local community they were you know shepherd to these special schools the idea stopped that and said no you have to be able to allow the child to have the education in your local communities and be able to just go to their regular high school or any elementary school you know whatever um rosa's law was a law that uh, got, it, it changed the language from, you know, it got rid of the word mental retardation and all the federal and state paperwork and replaced it with intellectual disability. Which, for me, I look at that law and I say, well, I, I'm more focused on the attitude because I don't, really, I don't want to have to change, I don't want to have to make another law like this. <laughs> another, we shouldn't have to make another law like this, but it's good that we did when we did. Um, the ABLE Act was a, uh, a law that helped people with disabilities that use SSI, which is Social Security Insurance. And it's a dis SSI disability, which basically is body that people that disabilities that can't work, they get. Uh, before, you could only s save up to $2,000 a month, and you couldn't save. And so, you know, people were kind of forced to live in poverty because they weren't allowed to save their money. And this kind of helps fix that is it made it so that people that use SSI can have save, saving accounts in their name and be able to save their money for future things like a house or getting into higher education or those kind of things that just makes it, fulfills their lives better and gets them out of poverty. <laughs> so do you have any questions or comments? Um. I have a question about the mental dis incident. If um, if there's people who is like learning disability and autism, like you, they can work with them. Instead, that there's people who like with like um, they thought of killing somebody or thought of you know, you should be open and then you just work with them to help them out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, was that a question? Yeah, or? it's like a question to you. It's like okay. why you don't um, work with them instead of closing it? Work, work with the institutions? In the mental institution in Washington that you guys were talking about? Yeah. Why you don't um, work with them instead of closing it? Um, well, they don't really want us working with them. So, mm -hmm. you know, we uh, self-advocacy groups have tried that to try to say, okay, can we try to reason with you? And the institutions have not really been responsive to that. And also, they, they kind of, um, they don't think that we, they, they feel that, I, honestly, part of it I don't know. 
why it didn't why they don't want to work with us but also I think of it this way if you live in an institution there's a lot of freedoms you don't have you know you can't go out by yourself at night like you know you know me as an adult I can at night you know I, if I want to go and have a night walk I can just walk out my front door nobody's going to say a thing for a person with a disability the living in institutions they don't have that freedom the personal freedom that institutions do not allow that I don't believe is right. I think that people with disabilities should have the same respect and rights and freedom as everyone else. And that is why, that is why I'm very passionate about setting down institutions. I lived in an institutional orphanage for the first five and a half years of my life. And I, I didn't have any freedom. I didn't you know, play when I wanted to play you know, everything was structured, everything, you know, you had to have your meal at a certain time, you had to get in bed at a certain time, you had to do all these things at a certain time so that it's easier on the staff. The problem with that, it takes away people's freedom to choose when they want to eat, when they want to get up in the morning. All these things that other adults, you know, we have some choice in, we have some freedoms in. People that are put in these institutions, they don't have, and I don't think that's right. You shouldn't be imprisoned just because of the way that you were born. That is my message with why I want to shut down the institutions. Any other questions? Yeah? So you're talking a lot around, well, thank you for so much for um, sharing about what a true inclusion looks like. And you talk a lot around systems and the history of how the inclusion has come to be. How can we create an inclusive environment here? I know there's some things around policy. You talked a lot around attitudes, so then what are some things, because I know you broke down barriers of ways that really you know, separates us rather than including us. So what are further ways that as students, as faculty, staff here to create a true inclusive environment around you know, how do we include Okay. So my thing with that, it's just, you know, if you meet a person with a disability, just see them as any other person. You know, respect them as you would respect any other person. Like, um, if, you, if you're confused about something and you don't know how, if they, if they look like they need help with something, just ask them, do you need help with something? Because that actually really helps me. If I'm on campus and I'm lost, or if I'm confused about something, for me, it's really helpful when other people are like, I see that you seem distressed. Do you need any help with anything? That really helps me. And you know, I'm able to say, yeah, I, I need to get to this building. And if people are willing to help, and you know, if we can make you know, the centers and everything just more inclusive in the way we support people, and just, you know, if people just need, you know, sometimes people with disabilities need to be explained something differently. Like instead of verbally telling somebody something, maybe somebody needs to have it written down for them to understand. And so just thinking about the different ways people communicate and understand that, you know, some people, you know, they may speak really loudly and they don't know that they're speaking really loudly. And so just being aware that everyone has different communication differences and they express their sadness and emotions differently. And so just, you know, not looking down at somebody for, you know, if they're not giving you eye contact or, you know, if their body language seems off, you know, like just, you know, accepting them as a person and not seeing, you know, thinking, oh, that person looks suspicious. I don't know about that person. Instead, just accept them. Yeah? Um, well, I, we have about three minutes left, and so I just kind of wanted to maybe have you end on a follow-up to, to Nora's question. Because um, I know you and I have had conversations. Yeah. So do you want to just kind of end by talking about your college experience and when it was that you really felt included in part of that campus at, at Central? Yeah. Well, when I first got to Central Washington University, I was really lonely. I, nobody really wanted to sit by me. I always sat by myself at lunch. And there were times, you know, I would cry. Like, I was just so lonely. But the thing that really helped me was getting into clubs. Getting in, meeting with other students. I started going, I, you know, one day I was walking around the student union and I saw, I saw this, uh, this office area and it was called the CDSJ, the Center for Diversity and Social Justice. 
And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And I just walk in there, and you know, they had these nice couches, and it just looked really inviting and warm. And people came up to me like, oh, hi, welcome. How are you? And it was really welcoming and really like, hey, you want to hang out here? You know, you're totally welcome to hang out here anytime you want. If you want to have dinner here or have lunch, you're totally welcome. And they would just talk to me, and they just, you know, it's like, how, you know, how did you get here? And, you know, what classes are you taking? Or like, if I needed help with homework, I was able to go there and get help. And, you know, there's just really kind people. And anytime I was like confused about what they said, or like I would be looking at their books, and I'd be like, what is this book about? Or what is this book about? You know, like they were really accepting of my questions and they were willing to answer them. And, you know, I, I built my friendships through that center. And, you know, I found a disability student you uh, a disability student union through there called able which i got involved with that group and i made a lot of friends through that and so i a lot all, most of my friends at central are through because i went to the the club i went and just met with different uh people that were involved at, in the school government and stuff and that really helped and those people were just really welcoming so just be really welcoming to people really you know how is your day and just like you know don't you know shut people you know like oh i'm too busy for you you know like or you know if, just just be welcoming like that's the best thing you can do is just make people feel wanted yeah any other questions well thank you for your time